On Sunday night, March 29, 2009, 48-year-old Valerie Looney pulled a fresh hot pizza from an oven at Pizza Plus, a busy restaurant in a small mountain town in Tazewell County, Virginia. Valerie slid the pizza onto a serving tray and then walked around the front counter and delivered it to a booth filled with local police officers. The officers thanked Valerie by name and then dug into their pizza. Valerie checked on the other diners, who had filled up almost all of the booths inside the restaurant, and then afterward, she headed around the front counter and went back into the kitchen. And there, she saw her husband, Harvey, standing by one of the pizza ovens. Valerie was short with cropped brown hair, and Harvey was a big guy with gray hair and a bushy beard. But despite the huge differences in their physical appearances, everybody who knew them thought they had always looked perfect together. Harvey pointed to the clock hanging on the wall by the oven, and he grinned at his wife. He said it was only a few more hours until their 29th anniversary. Valerie smiled back and then jokingly told Harvey to get back to work. Valerie had been the manager at Pizza Plus for over 10 years, and her husband Harvey had been working for her for the past seven years. The couple knew a lot of people would shudder at the thought of working alongside their spouse day in and day out, but it was actually what Valerie and Harvey had always wanted. In fact, while other people might dream about, you know, making a ton of money or traveling the world, all Valerie and Harvey ever wanted was just to spend as much time together and also with their son Chris as possible. And so Valerie and Harvey working together accomplished a portion of that goal. Harvey got back to work, like his wife had jokingly suggested, and he began to prepare some pizza dough for the next order. As he did that, Valerie stood up on her toes and gave Harvey a kiss on the cheek, and then she headed back into the restaurant's dining room. Pizza Plus was a really popular restaurant in this little town. The entire town only took up a few square miles, and it was surrounded by thick woods and then mountains beyond that. And at times, the people who lived there could feel isolated from the rest of the world. And so Pizza Plus had become almost like a meeting place, where everybody could get together and feel connected to their community, at least for a little while. And Valerie and Harvey had really embraced that aspect of their work. The two of them always seemed so happy and welcoming to patrons. I mean, they wanted their customers to feel like they were hanging out with family when they were there. Valerie made her way through the dining room, and she checked in with the police officers to make sure their pizza was good. They told her it was delicious, as always. Then Valerie stepped towards the next booth, but she suddenly stopped and stared down at the floor. One of the police officers noticed and asked her if everything was okay, and Valerie smiled and said it was fine, but she quickly turned and marched right to the back of the restaurant. When she got there, she stepped into the supply closet near the back door, and she saw her employee, Brian Lee, bent down and stocking some shelves. Brian heard his boss approaching him, so he slowly stood up and he turned around. Brian was in his 20s, and he towered over Valerie. Brian asked Valerie what she wanted, and she told him that before he went home tonight, he would need to make sure he mopped the floors in the dining room really, really well, because she was just out there and they looked so dirty. Brian slowly exhaled and had to stop himself from snapping at his boss. Then he just said, okay, I'll mop the whole place after we close. Valerie could tell Brian was annoyed at her, but he was always annoyed when he was at work. For a second, Valerie thought about scolding him, but she stopped herself. Instead, she just thanked Brian and then turned and walked back to the front counter. Pizza Plus stayed busy the whole night until they closed around 10 p.m. Valerie and Harvey said goodbye to the last of their customers, and when the dining room was empty, Valerie walked to the counter and opened up the cash register. And while Valerie counted the money and did the paperwork for the night, Brian trudged out to the front of the store and began mopping, and Harvey cleaned up the kitchen and the back of the restaurant. And at some point after cleaning for a while, Harvey picked up a large bucket of ice and shouted towards the front of the store to Valerie that he was going out back to dump the ice. Valerie responded by saying that Brian was finished with the mopping and she was almost done with the paperwork, so when he was done, they could leave. Harvey carefully picked up the ice bucket, walked out the back door, and dumped the ice onto a small patch of grass. And after he was done, he set the bucket down and Harvey just bent over at the waist, trying to catch his breath. He hated to admit it, and he would never want his wife or his son Chris to see him like this, but even the smallest physical tasks, like dumping this ice, had really started to wear Harvey out. And so after standing outside in private for a couple of seconds there, Harvey was about to go back inside when suddenly he heard screaming coming from inside the restaurant. And so instantly Harvey charged back inside and the second he did, the screaming got louder and louder and he called out for his wife. But then a second later, the screaming completely stopped and the entire restaurant went completely silent. At 8.40 a.m. the following morning, a woman named Mary Fullen walked down the street towards Pizza Plus. She was on her way to open up the restaurant that day and then work the lunch shift. 
Mary passed a car wash not far from the restaurant, and she waved to a couple of people outside trying a car. Then she walked a bit further down the street and went around to the back of Pizza Plus. When she got there, she looked down and reached into her pocket to grab her key to the back door. But when she looked up, she saw Harvey laying face down right behind the back of the store. And so Mary ran over to him and began yelling his name. But as she did, she could see he was laying in a pool of blood. Mary shook him like it might wake him up, but she knew he was dead. And so in a total panic, Mary threw open the back door of the restaurant, barely noticing she didn't have to use her key to get in. And then once inside, she ran for the phone on the front counter to call police. But before she could even get there, when she was in the kitchen, she looked down and found Valerie, who was also on the floor, blood covering her hair and her clothes. It was obvious that she was dead too. And so Mary began crying and her whole body was shaking, but she still made it to the phone and she dialed 911. The operator told her police would be right there and that for now she needed to get out of the restaurant immediately. And so Mary hung up and just ran out the front door, not noticing that that door too was also unlocked. A few minutes later, the Tazewell chief of police, David Mills, pulled up in front of the Pizza Plus and just sat there in his car for a minute. When the call had come into the station, Mills and the small group of officers who worked under him couldn't believe it. They all knew Valerie and Harvey really well. In fact, they usually went to Pizza Plus as a group at least a few times a week. Mills looked out his windshield and he saw a couple of officers from the county sheriff's department standing with Mary in front of the restaurant, the woman who had called the sin. Mills took a long, deep breath, then stepped out of his car and went up and joined them. All of the officers knew Mary about as well as they knew Valerie and Harvey. Mills could see Mary was a total wreck, and so while he didn't want to press her too hard, he did ask her if she could just fill him in on everything she had seen and heard that morning. Mary told Mills she'd been coming in to open the restaurant when she had found Harvey out back, and then when she ran inside to use the phone, she found Valerie lying on the kitchen floor. Mills told Mary he was so sorry she had to see that, and then he asked her if she had had to use her key to unlock the door when she went inside. Mary looked like she hadn't even thought about this, and then she told Mills and the other officers that were there that actually the back door had been unlocked when she ran in. And also, now that she thought about it, the front door had also been unlocked when she ran back out again. Mills thanked her and then asked her to please wait outside. Then Mills and one of the county officers put on their gloves and walked into the restaurant. The sight of Valerie laying there on the kitchen floor, surrounded by a huge pool of blood, almost knocked Mills back. He had known Valerie for years, and he couldn't remember a single person ever speaking badly about her. It might sound foolish to people outside of the area, but as the manager of the local pizza place, Valerie was a huge part of this community. And sometimes, after a bad day, a good slice of pizza and a great conversation with Valerie could turn everything around. Mills and the county officer went over and knelt down and began to examine Valerie's body, and it was even worse than they thought. Valerie had several horrible wounds on her head and neck. In fact, she had been attacked so violently that she had almost been decapitated. After a moment, Mills and the other officer stepped back from the body, and they both just could not believe what they were looking at. This was not a town where homicides happen very often. And for these two officers and basically all the officers on site, like they had never dealt with anything this gruesome. Mills and the other officer collected themselves. And then Mills noticed that from where he was standing, he could see the front counter. And he noticed at the front counter was the cash register and the drawer was open and it appeared to be empty. So Mills's first thought was that somebody had come in to rob the place when Valerie was counting cash and closing for the night. And maybe Valerie put up a fight and the robber attacked her and killed her. And then obviously at some point after that, Harvey must have gotten involved and gotten attacked and killed too. The investigators headed down a hallway to the back door and they stepped outside. And there they saw Harvey's body on the ground. He did have one major wound, but it didn't look like the attack on him had been nearly as violent as the one on his wife. Mills knew they still needed to do a thorough sweep of the restaurant, but already just the sight of these two bodies made it clear to him that neither the local police nor the county sheriff had the resources to deal with a case like this on their own. There had not been a recorded robbery homicide in the county in 20 years, and as far as Mills knew, there had actually never been a double homicide in this area, and certainly not one that involved this level of brutality. So Mills grabbed his cell phone and he made a call to the Virginia State Police. And then after the call, he and the other officer went back into the Pizza Plus and began searching the entire restaurant. 
and it wouldn't take them long to find multiple pieces of evidence that seemed to paint a picture of a vicious struggle that had taken place the night before. Mills located blood spatter on the pizza ovens not far from Valerie's body, and he saw bloodstains in the sink, like maybe the killer or killers had tried and failed to clean up after themselves. Then Mills heard the other officer calling for him. The officer was standing a few feet away from the pizza ovens, staring at a fire extinguisher that was hanging on the wall. And when Mills joined him and looked at the extinguisher, he saw all these blood stains on the bottom of it. And so it seemed like the extinguisher had to have been one of the murder weapons. A moment later, the two policemen left the kitchen and headed down towards the hall towards the back door again, where Harvey's body was. They had already searched the area once, but this time they were going to do a more thorough search. And this time they noticed a mop leaning up against the wall next to a bucket. Mills walked over to it and knelt down, and he noticed in the mop head were several pinkish spots that looked like blood. And what struck both investigators about this mop and the bloody fire extinguisher as kind of odd was that after both items had been used, it looked like they had been placed back where they belonged. They just kind of put them back as if nobody would notice. And so Mills and the other officer began speculating about who would do something like that, And they both agreed that, you know, while this was kind of a flimsy theory, it seemed like maybe it was an employee who was responsible because an employee would know where the fire extinguisher went and where the mop went. You know, they both seemed to be back where they belonged. And so perhaps just kind of out of habit, you know, they put those things back. A few minutes later, Mills and the other officer started yet another walk through the restaurant. And as they did, they heard several cars pull up out front. Mills stopped what he was doing and went outside, and there he saw members of the Virginia State Police and a state forensics team heading his way. A man wearing a dark suit extended his hand and introduced himself as Agent John Santola of the Virginia State Police. Mills shook Santola's hand, introduced himself, and said he was glad to have some help. Then Agent Santola and the forensics team walked inside the restaurant to take blood samples and look for other possible DNA samples, and as Mills stood there outside, something suddenly hit him. He would now have to go tell Valerie and Harvey's son, Chris, that his parents were dead. While state police searched the Pizza Plus... Mills and the county officer drove across town to the small trailer where Valerie, Harvey, and Chris had all lived together. When they got there, Mills walked up to the door and knocked, and shortly after, Chris answered. Chris was 28 years old, he wore a black sweatshirt and jeans, and he looked really confused to see two police officers standing there. He asked Mills if everything was okay, but Mills just shook his head and asked if they could come inside. Chris said, yeah, of course, and he let the officers in. And then once Mills and his partner got inside, Mills just turned to Chris and with a sad look in his face, he told him that unfortunately, both of his parents were deceased. They had been attacked and killed at the restaurant. For a moment, Chris just stared at Mills like he was in total shock. And then he began shaking his head and said, no, that doesn't make any sense. Today, his parents were out of town on a trip for their 29th wedding anniversary. But Mills just shook his head and said he was very sorry, but that could not be true. His parents had not left town. In fact, they had never left the restaurant the night before. Chris eventually sat down and just stayed silent for a couple of minutes, and the officers just waited. And then, with a shaky voice, Chris said he should have known something was wrong when he didn't hear his mother and father come home the night before, and then also this morning when he didn't see him. But Chris said he had just assumed his parents got home when he was already asleep, and that they had left that morning before he woke up to go on their trip. But now he felt like it was obvious there had been an issue. Mills nodded his head and said he was sorry to have to do this, but he did need to ask some pretty pointed questions about his parents. And Chris just nodded. And so Mills asked Chris where he was the night before. And Chris said he had been at work. And then afterward, he had come home, hung out for a bit, and then went to bed. Then Mills asked Chris what his relationship was like with his parents. Chris said their relationship had been good. He had been forced to move back in with his parents after going through a divorce, and he felt bad about it, but his mom and dad seemed happy to have him at home. After that, Mills asked Chris if he could think of anyone who might have had a grudge against either of his parents. And Chris just shook his head and said, absolutely not. Everybody loved his mom and dad. Mills knew this was actually pretty much the truth. I mean, Harvey and Valerie were beloved in this town. So he wasn't surprised their son couldn't think of anyone. 
Mills said how sorry he was for Chris's loss, and he promised the police would do everything they could to get the person who had killed his parents. Then Mills and the other officer turned to leave, but then Chris told them to hold on for a second. Mills turned around, and Chris asked him if a guy named Brian Lee had been working with his parents the night before. Mills admitted they had not gotten that far yet, but he asked Chris why would it matter if Brian in particular had been working. Chris just said his mom complained a lot about Brian and often got into arguments with him whenever they were working together. Mills thanked Chris for the information and said they'd be in touch, and then he and the other officer walked outside, got in the car, and headed back to the crime scene. And on the way, Mills called into the station and asked them to get in touch with Brian Lee. On March 31st, so two days after Valerie and Harpy's murders, Police Chief Mills and Agent Santola met Brian Lee as he walked into the local police station. Brian was young and very tall, and he already looked like he wanted to turn around and make a run for it. The news about the murders had spread through town almost as soon as cop cars started pulling up to the Pizza Plus, so Brian knew exactly why he'd been brought in. Mills and Santola led Brian to a small interview room, and inside was a table and chairs. Brian sat down on one side, Mills and Santola sat down on the other. And pretty much right away, what investigators noticed was Brian just could not sit still. And then, before the interview really even got going, Brian said something that totally threw off Mills and Santola. Brian wanted to know how much cash the killer had taken from the register. Now, nobody had told Brian that the register had been robbed, but the investigators knew this news could have gotten out pretty easily. Still, they were surprised that Brian's first question, when two people he worked closely with had been murdered, was about the money in the register. Agent Santola said they couldn't discuss those details with Brian. And then after that, he asked Brian to please talk them through the last time he had seen Valerie and Harvey. Brian said he'd been working with the couple on the night they were killed, and the place had been pretty busy. Then, once they closed, he said he mopped the whole restaurant, just like Valerie had told him to do, and then after that, he clocked out and he left. Now, right away, the mop stood out to Mills, because they had found blood on the head of the mop. And so Mills, as discreetly as he could, asked Brian where he left the mop when he left. And Brian quickly said he left it close to the back door, where it was supposed to go. Mills followed up this question by asking if anybody else was still at the restaurant when he had left. Brian seemed confused, and he said, yeah, of course, Valerie and Harvey were still there. Valerie was doing paperwork, and Harvey was waiting for her to finish. After he said this, Santola just stared across the table at Brian, not saying anything. And this seemed to really make Brian uncomfortable. But Santola was not actually trying to intimidate this kid or anything. He was just trying to size him up to see if he fit the profile of the murderer. Brian was young and certainly looked strong enough and big enough to overpower the older married couple. But Valerie's murder had been so violent, so gruesome, that Santola really believed the killer had to have been harboring some deep anger against her. This just didn't seem like a crime that could be committed by a stranger. Santola finally broke his silence and asked Brian if he'd recently had an argument with Valerie. And Brian responded by laughing. Santola and Mills looked at each other confused. This was not the response either of them had expected. But then Brian explained and said that he and Valerie had a whole bunch of arguments all the time. Because in his opinion, Valerie was a really tough manager and she was always riding him at work. And sometimes he just didn't want to put up with it and so he snapped back at her and they'd get into these arguments. But then Brian noticed the investigator's reaction to his laughing, and he quickly stopped laughing and got a much more serious look on his face. And then he clarified by saying that, you know, he might not have liked Valerie as a boss, but he would never hurt her. That was crazy. A lot of people don't like their bosses, but they don't kill them. Santola and Mills would follow up with a few more questions, and then eventually they would tell Brian he could leave. But as soon as he was gone, they both agreed that Brian was definitely a primary suspect. Over the following days, local, county, and state investigators looked further into Brian's background. And as they did that, they waited for results from tests that the crime lab was running on the blood samples that had been found at the crime scene. But while they waited, Santola and Mills did not want to overlook any possibilities. They both believed the most likely killer was somebody who worked at Pizza Plus, even if it turned out not to be Brian. So they went ahead and met with every single current employee. But when they spoke to Mary, the employee who had actually found the two bodies and called 911, she said she thought there might be another possibility. She said the car wash that was right by Pizza Plus was one of the main spots in town where people bought and sold drugs. 
And Mary said some of these buyers and dealers, who were pretty easy to spot, came into the pizza place quite often. And she said one of those people in particular, a guy named Homer, was really creepy. In fact, Mary and Valerie talked about how creepy Homer was. Mills got some information about Homer from Mary and then thanked her for the help. Now, Mills knew there had always been issues with drugs around that car wash, but these were not big-time drug dealers or anything. And so the idea that one of them had been crazed enough to rob the Pizza Plus and brutally murder two people inside seemed far-fetched. But still, Mary had said Valerie had been creeped out by this Homer guy, and so Mills and Santola couldn't ignore that. The investigators would track Homer down at the car wash, and at first glance, he really wasn't scary or angry or creepy or anything. He was just really quiet-seeming. Santola asked Homer if he had recently spoken to Valerie or Harvey, and Homer would say he had seen both of them at Pizza Plus on the night they died, but he had not spoken to either of them. But Mills quickly jumped in and said that didn't make sense, because if Homer really went into the restaurant that night, he definitely would have talked to one or both of them when he was ordering or getting his food. But Homer shook his head and said he actually didn't go inside the restaurant. He said he had just sat in his car in the Pizza Plus parking lot, and then through the window, he had seen Valerie, Harvey, and all the other patrons and employees inside the restaurant. Mills was confused and asked Homer, like, wait a minute, you just sat in the parking lot watching people eat pizza? And Homer, whose expression was totally neutral, just nodded and said, yeah. And then he said after a few minutes of sitting there watching people eat, he drove home. Santola and Mills didn't know what to make of Homer. I mean, they tried to ask him questions to figure out why he was doing that and did he do this often, but really Homer didn't offer much of anything. He just seemed incredibly creepy. And so eventually when the investigators left because they weren't getting anywhere talking to Homer, you know, they got in their car and they're both like, wait, like who is this guy? Was he a stalker? You know, is he casing the place we could rob it later? Or is he just like kind of strange and lonely? But whatever the answers were, the investigators now had another viable suspect. In addition to the Pizza Plus employee, Brian, they now had Homer. And they held out hope that when all the forensics evidence came back, it would point to one of them. On April 3rd, 2009, so a week after the murders, Pizza Plus was once again filled with laughter and conversation. The crime scene had been cleared, and now this was a gathering place once again. But this time, the community had come here not to eat pizza, but to pay their respects to Valerie and Harvey. There had been a funeral service for the couple at a local church, but everybody who knew them knew this restaurant is where they would want people to come, and they would also want people to have a good time. So Valerie and Harvey's son, Chris, and other members of the family thanked everyone for coming in and encouraged them all to take up seats in all the booths and just start sharing stories of all their favorite memories with the couple. And so over the course of the day, several local and county police officers came by the restaurant. Now, it's actually common for police to attend funerals of murder victims, basically to study the actions of people who were close to the victim, to look for suspects. But that was not why most of the cops were here today. So many of them had spent several nights a week in Pizza Plus, eating pizza and chatting with Valerie and Harvey. It was part of their routine. And so the officers were here to honor their memories, same as everybody else. In the days and weeks that followed the funeral and that memorial service inside of the restaurant, investigators continued to pursue two different theories. The first theory was that Brian or another Pizza Plus employee had some issue with Valerie or Harvey or both, and they carried out the murders as a result of that. The other theory was Homer, the man who had watched Valerie through the window from the parking lot, who also was involved in drugs, could have killed Valerie and Harvey because he was robbing the place for drug money. Or maybe he killed them for, you know, some other motive that had not been discovered yet. And so police interviewed and re-interviewed everybody working at Pizza Plus, and they also expanded their search to include former employees. And simultaneously, they looked into people who were associated with Homer. But none of these interviews really led anywhere. And to make things worse for investigators, the test results from the crime lab came back as inconclusive. The forensics team had identified the victim's blood in the restaurant, but they could not find clear DNA samples pointing to anybody else. Eventually, Agent Santola got called away from the case to work on other state police business, and the case really began to weigh even heavier on Police Chief Mills, who now was basically running the investigation on his own. And pretty quickly, Mills began to lose sleep over this case, 
He felt like his team was always so close to solving the crime, but no new concrete evidence ever appeared, and so they never had enough to pin the murder on any of their suspects. Months and months went by, and then years went by, and still Mills could not figure out who killed Valerie and Harvey. And then eventually, when still this case had not been solved, Mills retired. And so with Mills gone and no new leads coming in, this double homicide became the only cold case in Tazewell County. And so family and friends had all but given up on the chance that Valerie and Harvey's killer would ever be brought to justice. But then, years after the murders, a new police chief and a new county sheriff decided that reopening and solving this cold case had to be their top priority. And they made a decision that would finally crack the whole thing wide open. On February 13th, 2013, almost four years after Valerie and Harvey's murder, a man named Rich Byington walked into the Tazewell County Sheriff's Department. Rich looked like an average middle-aged guy in a golf shirt and khaki pants, but he just so happened to be one of the most effective interrogators in the entire United States. Rich was so good, he actually taught other members of law enforcement how to interrogate, and he taught a very specific form of interrogation. It was known as the Reed Technique. The new sheriff and one of his deputies met Rich as he walked into the building. The sheriff thanked him for coming in, and Rich said he was happy to help. Rich had spent the last several weeks going over the cold case and talking with past and present law enforcement officers who had worked on it. And Rich, like the sheriff, knew that these officers were smart, dedicated, and hardworking, but none of them had had any real experience interrogating murder suspects until the murders of Valerie and Harvey. And Rich believed that employing the right interrogation tactics with this case would make all the difference. He felt like he just needed a chance to sit down face-to-face with one of these potential killers. The deputy led Rich into an interview room, and both men would sit down on the other side of a table from one of the major suspects in the case. And not long after that, Rich began his interrogation. Among other things, the read technique creates a high-pressure environment for the person being interviewed, and it combines this pressure with words and acts of sympathy shown towards the suspect. And so Rich, who was famous for using the read technique, began using it during this interview. And throughout the interview, as planned, the suspect could never really seem to get their footing, and every time they started to look comfortable, Rich would throw a question at them or made an outright accusation that sent the suspect back into a panic. Hours went by, and the deputy could not believe that Rich just never seemed to tire. He just kept going, wearing the suspect down, and then making the suspect believe the police were really on their side, over and over and over again. And then finally, well into this interview, in this totally calm, caring voice, Rich laid out to the suspect what he believed had actually happened to Valerie and Harvey. And the read technique must have worked, because as Rich spoke, this suspect who police had interviewed multiple times over the course of several years, finally broke down and confessed to everything. By the time Rich left the sheriff's department, investigators finally knew who had murdered Valerie and Harvey Looney. Based on that suspect's confession, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened to Valerie and Harvey at the Pizza Plus restaurant on March 29th, 2009. That night, around 10.30 p.m., the killer walked across the Pizza Plus dining room towards the front counter. There, they saw Valerie, bent over the register, counting out the cash. The killer cleared their throat to get Valerie's attention, and Valerie looked up, at which point the killer asked her a question. And when she answered, the killer started shouting at Valerie, but Valerie wasn't intimidated. She shouted right back, and soon the two of them were having a full-blown fight right there in the middle of the restaurant. And at some point, the killer got so mad and so frustrated that they rushed at Valerie, and Valerie screamed and tried to run away, but the killer chased her into the kitchen and grabbed her with one hand and picked up a large knife with the other. Valerie struggled and fought, but she couldn't break free, and the killer raised the knife and slit Valerie's throat. Valerie fell to the floor, bleeding profusely, and the killer just dropped the knife. But suddenly, the killer heard shouting and footsteps coming from the back of the restaurant, and so the killer turned and saw Harvey charging down the hall. 
The killer rushed at him, and Harvey managed to punch the killer, but he quickly realized he was no match for them, and so Harvey turned and tried to run towards the back door, but the killer followed and managed to grab Harvey right by the door, and the killer wrapped their hands around Harvey's throat and began to choke him. Harvey fought as much as he could and managed to stumble out through the back door onto the ground outside. The killer scrambled to their feet and managed to grab Harvey's throat again and kept on squeezing. But at some point, Harvey managed to buck the killer off one more time, and the killer was about to re-engage for a third time when Harvey just kind of abruptly fell forward on his face and just lay there motionless. It would turn out Harvey actually just had a heart attack. And so the killer just stood there for a second, not really sure what to make of this, and then they turned and ran back inside to the kitchen. There, they saw Valerie face down in a pool of blood, but the killer wanted to make sure she really was dead. So the killer grabbed the fire extinguisher off the wall, stood over Valerie, and raised it up and began slamming it down over and over again into the back of her head. And after nearly decapitating her, the killer put the fire extinguisher back where it went on the wall, blood still all over it, and then they picked up the knife they had used to slit Valerie's throat. Then they walked out through the back door to where Harvey was still lying motionless on the ground, and just like the killer had done with Harvey's wife, they wanted to be sure Harvey really was dead. So the killer bent down and used that knife and slit Harvey's throat as well. After that, the killer went inside, they grabbed the mop and bucket by the back door, they went to the kitchen and filled that bucket with water. They grabbed the cash out of the register and pocketed that, and then they mopped their way out through the back of the store, trying to get the floor as clean as they could without spending too much more time inside of the restaurant. After wringing out the mop and emptying the water, the killer left the mop and bucket by the back door, walked outside past Harvey's body, and disappeared into the night. The following day, the killer went into work like nothing had happened, and then they went home and waited patiently for the police to arrive to tell them that their mother and father had been killed. Valerie and Harvey's son, Chris Looney, murdered his parents in cold blood. It turned out that after his divorce, Chris had been struggling with money. And so Valerie and Harvey had helped him for a while, but they had had enough. So on the night of the murder, Chris went to Pizza Plus one last time to ask for money, but Chris had already planned on killing his parents if they denied him. Because Chris knew his parents had a $245,000 life insurance policy, and Chris was the beneficiary. And so when Chris's mom refused to give him money and started fighting with him in the restaurant, Chris went through with his plan B. He murdered his parents and then stole the money from the cash register to make it look like a robbery. Investigators had suspected Chris once they learned about this life insurance policy, but it was also the placement of the fire extinguisher and the mop that made him stand out to the police. Mills and the other investigators had always suspected a Pizza Plus employee had carried out the murders because the fire extinguisher, which was one of the murder weapons, and the mop had been put back exactly where an employee would put them, almost like it was habit. That was one of the primary reasons they had suspected Brian Lee early on. Now, Chris was not a Pizza Plus employee. However, when he was younger, he had been. And so over the course of several years, Mills and others felt like they were close to being able to prove Chris had done it, and they had interviewed him several times, but they could never find enough evidence or get him to admit to the crime. That is, until the new leaders of the investigation called in Rich Byington, the interrogation expert, for help. And after Rich faced off with Chris, Chris would confess to the murders and would tell police exactly how and why he had killed his own parents. Chris Looney was found guilty and was given two life sentences. After the trial, members of Valerie, Harvey, and Chris's family issued a joint statement. It said, quote, Chris, we love you and forever will love you, but we cannot forgive what you have done. End quote. On the evening of June 20th, 1965, four high school friends set off for a remote desert location about 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, that was within the very famous Death Valley. They arrived at their destination, which, if you didn't know any better, would just look like the middle of nowhere in the desert. But to them, they knew exactly where they were. And so they parked their car, they got out, and they began unloading very heavy underwater diving equipment and began walking it up a nearby hill. The group was made up of 19-year-old Paul Gian Contieri, his brother-in-law, 20-year-old David Rose, 19-year-old Bill Alter, and his younger brother, Jack, who was 16 years old. As these four boys walked their diving equipment up this hill, they were hit with sign after sign after sign that was telling them, do not go any farther, turn around. 
They made it to the top of the hill and they were met with a huge fence, which once again said, do not go any farther. Without any hesitation, they went right under the fence and began walking down the other side, which was a very steep 30 foot rocky slope that led down to this very narrow strip of water that was the entrance to a very famous underwater cave called the Devil's Hole. Their plan was to dive all the way down to the bottom of the cave, which was at 325 feet. So they get down to the bottom of the hill and they begin putting on their scuba gear. And Jack, the youngest, he's like, you know what guys, I'm having second thoughts. I don't wanna do this anymore. And they're like, all right, suit yourself. And so Jack volunteers himself to sit on the outside and be their lookout. The other three, Paul, David, and Bill, they're totally still doing this dive. And so they put on the rest of their equipment. They hop in the very warm water. It stays at about 92 degrees Fahrenheit year round inside of Devil's Hole. They check their flashlights a couple of times. And when they're ready, they signal to each other and they begin their descent down into the dark abyss that is the Devil's Hole. So for the next couple of hours, Jack just sat on the surface waiting for his brother and his two friends to return. And just after midnight, David and Bill did return, but Paul didn't. And so when David and Bill got to the surface, they asked Jack, hey, have you seen Paul? Because we got separated on the way up and we, we figured he was already up here. And Jack said, no, it's just you two. I, I haven't seen Paul. And so David and Bill look at each other and they know they have a problem. And they're like, we gotta go back down. And so they put the regulators back in and they turn and start swimming down. Bill would say when they went back down to look for Paul, Dave was leading and Dave was going really fast to the point where Bill couldn't keep up with him. And you gotta remember, it's pitch black down there and Bill's got his flashlight. That's the only way he can see Dave. And Dave was creating separation and getting farther and farther away. Bill had no way to stop him. And at some point he lost him. Dave was just gone. And so Bill, not wanting to turn this into an even bigger problem, stopped where he was and went back to the surface. And he and his brother Jack just sit there anxiously waiting for Dave and Paul to return, but they don't. And so at some point Jack went and got authorities. When the police got the report about the two missing divers inside of Devil's Hole, I'm sure on some level they were like, that's why the signs are there, you're not allowed to dive in there, but they put that aside and instead they contacted a guy named Jim Hoots, who was a professional diver who regularly dove inside of Devil's Hole, so he's very familiar with it, and they got him on scene within a couple hours to go looking for these guys. And originally, the hope was Paul and David had found their way into a section of Devil's Hole called Brown's Room, which was this big air pocket that perhaps in an emergency situation, they had found their way in there and now they're trapped. So Jim and his dive partner get to the edge of Devil's Hole, they put on their gear, they hop in the water and they begin their descent. And it's totally dark, they got their lights and they go down about 90 feet to where the tunnel basically funnels down to a point. And through this point, you have to wriggle through and push through. Once you get through that, you enter into this massive chasm that if you shine your light in any direction, the walls are so far away that initially it looks like you're shining a light into infinity. It's this massive, massive space. But for them to get to Brown's room, the first place they're gonna look for these guys, they needed to push through that little funnel and then immediately turn left and track the ceiling until they find a tunnel that goes back up again. And that is the tunnel that's very claustrophobia inducing. It's very tight. That if you take it 90 feet back up, you get to Brown's room and that's that big air pocket. And so Jim and his dive partner, they make their way up this tunnel, they get to the air pocket and there's no divers. And so they go back down through the tunnel, back into that huge chasm. And instead of going back to the surface, they knew that if they didn't find them in the air pocket, they were gonna go down a little ways and see if they could find them on this one area called the lower ledge. And so the lower ledge was just a rocky outcropping that was about halfway down to the bottom of the cave. It was a natural break point before you went to the bottom. And so as they're descending in this infinity chasm, Jim is shining his flashlight in every direction looking for signs of these guys. And at some point his light picks up a reflection on the lower ledge. And so they get down to the lower ledge and that reflection was from a dive mask, the, the glass of the dive mask. It was sitting right on the lower ledge and then next to it was a single dive fin. So Jim and his dive partner, they pick these items up, they go back up to the surface and they confirm with Jack and Bill Alter that yes, that mask and that fin belong to Dave and Paul. And then afterwards they say to the search party, look, we were in Brown's room and they weren't in there. And so there's nowhere else they could be alive. And by now they've run out of air. And so that mixed with the fact that we're finding their equipment strewn about the chasm, it's safe to say they're more than likely deceased. Jim and his dive partner said, look, we'd like to go back in and go all the way to the bottom. We stopped at the lower ledge, so we don't know what's down there. We anticipate we'll be able to find their bodies and we can at least confirm they're down there and then shift to a body retrieval mission. So Jim and his dive partner get back in the water. They go down the 90 feet to that little section you have to wriggle through to get into the chasm. Once they're inside, they keep going down, they pass the lower ledge and they go all the way down to 325 feet. 
Now this cave is huge and the floor bottom is huge, but it's not so huge that you wouldn't be able to spot two bodies that have just recently landed down here. And so Jim and his partner are scanning their light across the bottom, which is relatively flat. You can see pretty far because of how clear the water is and they're not seeing anything on the bottom. They're looking all over the place and there's no bodies, there's no equipment, there's nothing. And they're thinking, how are we missing this? How are we not able to see this? And it was at this point that Jim noticed a little hole in the bottom of the cave floor, barely big enough for a full-size person with tanks to fit through that he hadn't seen before. And so they make their way over to it. And Jim says, right when he was on the edge, he felt a fairly strong current being pulled past his legs down into this hole. It was almost like this was a drain on a bathtub and someone had pulled the plug and now all the water is draining into this little hole. And so Jim and his dive buddy kind of push themselves back to make sure they don't get sucked in. And Jim pulls out a weighted piece of string that goes out to 932 feet. And he would use this if there was ever a tunnel that he wanted to go down and he wanted to size up how deep it was. He would extend the line and he would let it fall until it hit something and then he would stop it. And on the line were marks of how deep it was. And so he let this line go inside of this hole and it went all the way down to 932 feet without touching any surface, meaning it's at least 932 feet deep from that point down. So Jim just pulls his line back up and he looks at his dive partner and he's like, yeah, no, we're not going down there. Not only were they not equipped to go that deep, they also both knew if we go in this hole, there's a good chance we won't be able to get back out again because the current is so strong. So Jim and his dive partner go back to the surface and they say, look, we couldn't find their bodies. But what we think happened is they developed nitrogen narcosis where you're in this sort of drunken state. You don't really know what's going on around you. And that suction slowly pulled them into this hole and they weren't really aware of their surroundings and they didn't stop themselves before they got pulled in. And then it was too late and they were pulled down into oblivion. To this day, they've never found their bodies and scientists still don't know how deep that hole is. But in 2012, there was an earthquake in Mexico, so 2,000 miles away from Devil's Hole, that caused a tsunami to come through Devil's Hole. I don't know how that actually works, but the scientists say that's what happened. And so scientists believe that hole leads to an underground ocean that connects to other parts of the world as far away as 2,000 miles. Today, diving is still strictly forbidden inside of Devil's Hole, unless you're a scientist and they stay far away from that hole at the bottom. Our next story is called No Limits. Free diving is one of the most dangerous sports in the world even though technically pretty much anybody who's ever swam before has then also free dived because all free diving is is diving underwater without the use of a breathing apparatus like a scuba tank but when people talk about free diving they're not talking about the kids down at the local swim club they're talking about those crazy people that go out into the middle of the ocean take huge gulps of air and then dive down to unbelievable depths and stay down there for several minutes before returning to the surface and within this already extreme sport, there's an even more extreme version of it called No Limits. Instead of the diver taking that big gulp of air on the surface and then turning around and thinning themselves down to depth or pulling themselves down on a weighted rope, in No Limits free diving, the divers are allowed to use whatever they want to get as deep as they can possibly handle. Again, the only rule is you can't use a breathing apparatus. The most common no limits technique is to grab hold of this sled that is connected to this bottom weighted vertical cable and the free diver holds onto that sled, it's released from the surface and the sled rockets down to whatever their desired depth is and the diver just holds on and then once they reach the bottom, the diver then turns a switch which shoots air into this big balloon that's attached to the sled and once the balloon is filled enough, it will pull the sled and the diver who's hanging onto it back up the cable back up to the surface. Normally, a no limits free dive using this technique takes approximately three minutes start to finish. The reason no limits is considered a more extreme version of free diving is because it allows the divers to go to these extraordinary depths that they physically are not capable of getting to on their own. We're talking about over 100 meters below the surface. There's just no way a person can just kick themselves down there. You would need the sled. And then conversely, you would not be able to swim 100 meters back up to the surface before you drowned. You would have to use that balloon. And so in No Limits Freediving, when you go down to these crazy depths, if your equipment fails, it's usually fatal. 
On October 12, 2002, 28-year-old Audrey Mestre was sitting on a floating platform off the coast of the Dominican Republic. The French native No Limits diver was mentally preparing herself for what she was about to do. Audrey was one of the best freedivers in the world, and this day she was trying to become the best freediver in the world by breaking the world record for the deepest depth achieved by a No Limits freediver, which was 170 meters. And that record was actually held by her husband, Pippin Ferreris. But as she sat on that platform, doubt must have crept into her mind because storm clouds began to roll in, and in the world of no limits free diving, where so many things can go wrong, there's no reason to add in another risk factor like bad weather. It could affect the people on the surface that are trying to support you. It could affect the line that you're using to bring you down to depth. It's just an unnecessary risk. Also, Audrey was using a new piece of equipment. She had a slightly thinner cable that was gonna bring her down to the bottom that her sled was attached to, but she didn't know if it would work for this deep of a dive. And her husband, who was in charge of safety for this dive, had been criticized in the diving community for rushing this record attempt that he hadn't done enough preparations, there weren't enough medical staff, there wasn't enough standby divers that were gonna be on site or on shore at the time of this dive. And Audrey was aware of these criticisms because her husband was regularly criticized in the no limits free diving world because six years earlier, he had had two separate people on staff die during different diving accidents. And people accused Pippin of being very reckless. But despite all of these red flags and reasons not to do this dive on this day, Audrey was really confident and wanted to do this. And so she signaled to her team that she was ready to start. She zipped up her yellow wetsuit and then checked her sensors and video camera she'd be using for the dive, and then she put on her fins. Meanwhile, her husband checked the balloon that was there to inflate and bring her back up to the surface. And because this piece of equipment was so crucial, Pippin insisted he was the only one that could touch it, even though normal procedure was that at least two other people would inspect the balloon before the No Limits dive. But regardless, after Pippin inspected the balloon bag and determined it was good to go, he signaled to Audrey to tell her it was time to start. She slipped off the platform and waded her way over to the 200 pound sled that was going to take her the equivalent of two football fields below the surface. Just before Audrey gave the final go ahead to actually release the sled and begin this dive, she did a procedure known as packing, where freedivers basically take a full breath of air in and then gulp down additional bits of oxygen to pack their lungs full. And then when Audrey was done with this process and was ready to go, she did give that final signal, they released the sled and she began rocketing down towards the bottom of the ocean. If all went to plan, she would be back on the surface in three minutes. Audrey's descent was going perfectly until she hit the 164 meter mark. Now, because of the bad weather on the surface and all the rough water, that new lightweight cable she had, it was too light. And so the waves caused it to sway. And down at 164 meters, that swaying caused kinks in the line itself. And so as the sled was coming down, it caught one of those kinks and stopped at the 164 meter mark. And so Audrey just had to sit there for 30 seconds until finally that kink straightened out and she was able to continue down past the record setting mark of 170 meters. Now that 30 second delay might not have mattered if everything else in the dive went perfectly, but unfortunately it did not. Once Audrey had set the record by hitting 171 meters, her sled came to a stop and now it was time for her to go back up to the surface. On the video, you can see Audrey begins following procedure, same as always. She reaches over and turns the valve that's supposed to inflate the balloon that's gonna bring her back to the surface. But after she turns the switch, nothing happens. The balloon does not inflate. For a second, you can see a hint of panic in her body language as she's almost out of breath. She's already had that 30 second delay at the beginning and she's pressing up against that three minute mark and she needs to get to the surface right now. But she stays calm, she reaches over, and she turns the switch again to see if maybe she hadn't turned it all the way the first time. But again, nothing happens. At this point, a standby diver noticed the sled was not moving up when it should have been, and so he rushed over and jammed one of his extra hoses with extra air up into the balloon and tried to inflate it himself. But there wasn't enough air coming out of this tank for it to fully inflate, and so the sled began to move painfully slowly up in the water column. Now you would think this standby diver who did have all sorts of extra air would just give the mouthpiece to Audrey to let her breathe on that. Forget the world record attempt, let's just save her life. 
But unfortunately, Audrey and the standby diver knew that because she was so deep, the pressure was so immense on her lungs that it actually constricted her lungs to the size of oranges, that if she took even a tiny gulp of air at depth, that air would expand so dramatically on the way up, it would kill her. And so all Audrey could do was cling onto the sled and very slowly ascend and try to hold her breath as long as she could, but she knew at some point she was going to drown. And the video shows her absolutely stoic, just riding that sled, knowing that that's about to happen. On the surface, when the three minute mark came and went and Audrey did not surface, her husband immediately threw on scuba gear and leapt in to try to save her. And by the time he got down to her and brought her out of the water, she had been underwater without air for eight minutes and 40 seconds. When she was put on the boat, she had a pulse, but there wasn't a doctor on standby to treat her right away. And Pippin had kept her underwater for a couple additional minutes, trying to resuscitate her underwater. Audrey was ultimately rushed to a hospital where she was later pronounced dead. The cause of death was drowning. Some believe Pippin, her husband, had intentionally sabotaged her dive in order to kill her, but the official investigation determined her death was accidental. The next and final story of today's episode is called Into the Heart. There is an island off the coast of Croatia called Šulta. Only 19 kilometers long by 5 kilometers wide, this tiny island is a short ferry ride and an ideal day trip from Split, which is Croatia's second biggest city. It's a hilly island with these beautiful pebble beaches and absolutely crystal clear water. It's a very popular tourist destination that's actually famous for its honey, as well as an underwater cave that kills virtually everyone who goes inside. On September 10th, 2002, 31-year-old Miroslav Kuklis was enjoying a vacation with friends on Šulta Island. It was a little after 8.30 in the evening when one of his friends suggested they go scuba diving. Because of its beautiful clear waters, Šulta Island is a very popular scuba diving destination. And so as such, scuba diving takes place really at all hours around Šulta Island, but the vast majority of it takes place in these safe little alcoves where it's not very deep and you can see fish and wildlife and it's very controlled. But Miroslav and his friends didn't want to do regular scuba diving. They wanted to check out the underwater cave they had heard about just south of Šulta Island in Poganica Bay. They had heard this cave was extremely dangerous and only expert divers were allowed to go in there. And even though they were not expert divers, they were barely novice divers, they thought, you know what, how bad can it be? Let's go check it out for ourselves. So they convinced one of the boat drivers to drive them out to the area in Poganica Bay that sat over where this cave entrance was. And so they put on their gear, they hop in his boat, they drive out, they jump in the water, and sure enough, right below the surface, about 10 meters down, is this hole on the sea floor. And that is the single entrance into this cave. When you go in this hole, you have to go down head first because it's so tight. And once you go down about 10 meters, you reach this junction where to one side, it leads to the shallow gallery, which is the space that goes down to 36 meters, and there's no other caves or entrances or anything off of it. It's just kind of like a chasm inside of the cave. From the junction, if you go the other way, it brings you to the deep gallery, which is just a bigger version of the shallow gallery, and it goes down to 57 meters. Inside of the deep gallery, however, at the very top on the ceiling, there is a very thin air pocket. Now, there's a few reasons why this cave is so dangerous beyond just being an underwater cave, which in and of itself is quite dangerous. The first one is the visibility inside of the cave is basically zero. The only light that comes in is through that single entrance that leads to that junction, but the light doesn't make it past the junction into the two galleries. So it is truly pitch black inside of those two galleries. You also have all this silt that's caked to the inside of the cave. So as soon as you get in there, your flippers and your movement, it kicks the silt off the wall and muddies the water around you to where even if you had a flashlight, it's like driving in fog. The lights only pick up the fog right in front of you. You can't see beyond the fog. Well, in a tunnel, you shine your light on silt and you're just going to see the silt, not beyond it. So basically going into this cave, you're going to be blindfolded. 
Another significant danger of being inside of this cave is after you've gone down to your respective gallery, whether it's the shallow or the deep gallery, when you're going back up again on your ascent and you're getting to that junction point, it is possible to confuse the other entrance to the other gallery with the exit to the cave. And so if you make that mistake and you go into the other gallery, remember, you're blind, you got silt kicked up, it's already dark, you need to, by touch, figure out you've made a mistake and then backtrack and go out the right way you came. And so if you're low on air and you make this mistake, you better hope you catch it fast enough that you can get out before your air runs out. So a little after 9.15 p.m., Miroslav goes in first, followed by his other two friends. Miroslav reaches the junction and he turns towards the deep gallery. He goes all the way down to 57 meters, he touches the bottom, he turns around, and he starts making his ascent. On the way up, he gets to the junction, and he makes the critical mistake of going into the shallow gallery, believing that is the exit to the cave. He probably got in there, bumped his head, started feeling around, he's kicking up silt, he's starting to panic, he's looking for the way out again. He finds the exit to the junction, but instead of taking the exit out of the cave, he makes the same mistake again and goes into the deep gallery. And now he's in the deep gallery, he's feeling around, he's running low on air, and based on his dive computer, he was fumbling around in there for quite some time. And having spent some time underwater myself in the pitch black as a Navy SEAL, I can tell you that it's very easy to imagine, you know, oh, it'd be so easy to stay calm and have your bearings and know where you are. But when you are completely in total pitch black underwater, it actually is hard to tell what's up, what's down. You can feel the pressure in your ears. That's a good way to tell where you are in the water. But, you know, realistically, it's totally possible to get completely disoriented underwater. And my guess is Miroslav was totally disoriented. And so he stopped and he's trying to make sense of what's happening. And at some point, Miroslav must have looked at his air gauge and realized, I'm out of air now. And he made one last push to try to get to the surface, but he hit a ceiling. And that's when he realized, based on maybe the touch and feel, maybe he took his gloves off and he was feeling around, he felt that he was in the air pocket, that thin amount of air that sat right at the top of the deep gallery. He must have realized at this point that there was so little air down here that he probably only had maybe a few minutes that he could be down here breathing before he was going to drown. And in terms of making his ascent to the surface on a breath hold, the only place where there's an air pocket is the deep gallery. And so probably he knew that. And so he's thinking, I'm, you know, maybe 40, 50 meters under the surface right now, and I can barely catch my breath now. I'm not going to be able to hold my breath to the surface. And so staring down a certain horrific drowning death, he pulled out his dive knife and he plunged it into his heart. And when they did his autopsy later, it would show he did not drown. He died because he had a knife in his heart. Back on the surface, the other two divers had gotten out successfully and they're in the boat and they're waiting for Miroslav. But after over an hour went by and he hadn't surfaced, they contacted the police. The police show up and they send two special divers down into the cave to look for Miroslav. One of those divers was a 25-year-old named Oliver Merich. And so these two divers go down and they're looking for Miroslav and they can't find him and they're running out of air. And on their ascent, Oliver Merich makes the same mistake that Miroslav did and gets trapped inside of the shallow gallery. The other diver initially made that mistake but managed to get out again, but Oliver went back and forth between the deep and the shallow gallery until he too drowned in that cave. It would take three days for the police to find and remove Miroslav and Oliver from this cave. And to this day, the police warn divers not to go in this cave unless they're experienced enough to be going in there. But year after year, inexperienced divers try their luck inside of this cave and they make that same mistake, they get trapped and they die.
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please ask the Amazon Music follow button to take a bike ride with you. And while they're moving, jab a stick in their front wheel. This podcast